I'm Natasha Taylor Bryson, huge fan of Dynasty, devotee of the original and unapologetic fan of the new. Here we go, my top 10 moments of episode 4 of the CW's Dynasty. Number 1. Fallon's clothes, or more specifically the show's amazing costume designer, Meredith Markworth Pollock. We have to take a moment to adore Meredith. I think she must have some spiritual connection with Nola Miller. She seems to be perfectly channeling his vision from the original dynasty. Her costumes are an exquisite echo of the 80s too much is never enough aesthetic, with taste levels that make them look thoroughly modern. In an interview in People magazine, Meredith was asked if there were any styles from the original dynasty that would not work for this new dynasty and her response was perfect. She just said, no, not really. Even shoulder pads, I'm down with shoulder pads. And can I say, Meredith, I'm down with everything you're doing. That turban by the pool, be still my beating heart. Heading for a night out on the town, Fallon sports a kind of black, one-sleeved, crisp shoulder pad with a uh, slicked back hair. Give that girl a guitar, crank up the stereo, she could have just walked off the video of Robert Plant's Addicted to Love. And later on we find her channeling her inner plastic. In this outfit, doesn't she look like a post-plastics makeover Lindsay Lohan from Mean Girls? Or is it just me? Number two, Claudia Now and Then. The level of the overtop opulence from the original dynasty, which was determined to make Dallas look like a bunch of peasants, meant that by the second series, men the mental distress of the character Claudia was represented mainly by flat hair, which in the 80s was seen as a sign that a woman had given up. We haven't seen a lot of the new Claudia so far, but she stood out, <laughs> even in those small moments that we have seen her, in all her unhinged fury, cardigan wearing, pulled through the hedge backwards to and well to wash her hair, woman in distress. I suspect new Claudia will be living up to the motto, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned in the future episodes. Watch out, Crystal. Number three. The classic soap opera move, the eavesdrop. Not the flashback, the eavesdrop, and we get two of them. Sam overhears Blake talking to the police chief Stansfield and realises that his friend has stolen something much more valuable than his aunt's ring. Gets completely panicked and caught out by Anders. And while we're talking about Sam, I have to say he gets one of the best lines in this episode. He's watching Crystal pack for the weekend away and uh, she holds up some lingerie and said that this trip is her honeymoon, to which Sam says, put that away. I don't need to see how Blake's sausage is made. <laughs> so the second eavesdrop comes in the nightclub where Michael over his Fallon tell Monique Colby that she only introduced Michael as her boyfriend to get rid of someone. And poor Michael looks absolutely crushed. Number five. After saying she has no interest in using the Carrington family name for a new business, Fallon reveals that her new name for the company will be Morel Green Energy. Now, Fallon claims Morel is her middle name. As fans of the original dynasty will know, Morel is the maiden name of Alexis, Fallon's mother and Blake's first wife. Well, it's conceivable that Fallon could have been given her mother's maiden name as her middle name. I suspect it's more of a nod to her mother than Fallon is willing to admit. Number four, the tantalising mentions of Alexis continue. Earlier in the episode, we had Stephen wishing his mum was around to give him some advice, while Fallon goes all Anne Rand and says the only thing we need is ourselves. And later in the episode, uh, Fallon is castigated by Michael, and Fallon tries to defend herself, saying that she was a bitch in high school because her mother had left, to which Michael basically says, well, that was 10 years ago. What's your excuse now? This hits home. Because at the end of the episode, we see Fallon going through her letters from her, she's kept from her mother, Alexis Morel Carrington. By the way, the postcard with, the, with Denver written in the font from the original Dynasty titles was a really nice touch. All quite touching, leading us to believe that Fallon's vociferous hatred of her mother may be a case of the lady doth protest too much. Well, that is until she throws the whole correspondence into the fire. I have to say this build up to Alexis's arrival is quite delicious and I am looking forward to the payoff. The introduction of the character of Corey Rux. 
Expecting an easy pitch to an Atlanta councilman who Fallon described to Jeff as willing to leave his wife and his side piece for her, not that she's willing to offer that, you understand. Fallon finds herself ill-prepared for the fact that Corey has taken over from her fellow councilman and Fallon has to do an actual pitch. Well, it gets worse. Fallon at the beginning makes the same mistake as the men in the airport bar did about her in the first episode. She underestimates Corey. She meets her and thinks she's an assistant and asks her for coffee. But the stinger in the tail, it gets worse, is that Corey went to school with Fallon. And while Fallon clearly doesn't remember anything about Corey, Corey remembers Fallon and it is not good. Corey is a cool customer actually. She does a really good line in the quiet, I just got the upper hand wry smiles. The best of which happens when Corey walks out of Michael's bedroom dressed only in his shirt, totally flummoxing Fallon. Number seven. Many facets of Anders. He continues crystal baiting. She's packing for a weekend getaway with Blake and Anders teases her about getting out of Dodge so soon after the uh, robbery and leaves with the instruction, don't forget to pack the silver. Anders is truly the keeper of secrets. Blake and the police chief Stansfield are in the study discussing the missing phone and the fact that it's in both their interests to get the phone back. I mean, Blake wants it back because of what's on the phone and Stansfield needs it back because he's the one that originally lifted it from uh, police evidence. Anders comes in with a tray and nonchalantly starts serving coffee. Blake doesn't bat an eyelid. Stansfield looks very, very uncomfortable. To which Anders gives a butter wouldn't melt slash I know everything kind of smile. Later in the episode, Michael invites Anders to a game of basketball. <laughs> and can we just take a moment to say how glorious is Michael shooting hoops? Oh my word. <sighs> now I grew up playing uh, netball. So if you throw me a basketball, there is no way I can move my feet without hearing my old PE teacher blow her whistle and shout traveling at me. But Michael, I would shoot hoops with you anytime. Well, unlike Anders, who when invited to play, says that would require sweat and remain stiff as a board. <laughs> as Michael throws him the ball, Anders is so buttoned up, he makes Sherlock Holmes look like a freewheeling hippie, queuing. Or more specifically, Fallon's line from the nightclub, how do people live like this, waiting in line? Proof that the rich have had their lives denuded of the simplest pleasures. In England, queuing is a national sport. Even it's even said that if a person stands still too long in England, somebody's going to form a line behind them. Not that we would call it a line. It is seen as the cornerstone of civilised society and thus Fallon, in her refusal to stand in line, signals her 1% of the 1% status loud and obnoxiously proud. Number nine, Jeff calling out Fallon. Finding out that Fallon failed to turn up for a business pitch, which they'd subsequently lost, because she was preoccupied with talking to the press about Crystal's sex tape. Jeff is not a happy man and says, I'm guessing you never played team sports as a kid. We're supposed to be in this together. You're no longer the only one who pays for your mistakes. And with this, poor, too rich to care, bitchy Fallon has more or less been called out by everyone in this episode. Number 10, the cliffhanger. Well, actually, it's the story that Blake tells Crystal about Stephen in the lead up to the let's have no secrets between us cliffhanger. Blake claims that Matthew tried to bribe him about an incident where Steve mucked up, Stephen mucked up on the job, which led to a man's death. And in an attempt to protect Stephen from the knowledge that he had actually caught, was responsible for somebody's death, Ma uh, Blake had Matthew write it off as faulty machinery. Not knowing too much about Blake at this point, other than he lies a lot, only in order to protect his family, you understand. I'm getting uh, a serious unreliable narrator vibe from Blake. Can we believe anything he said? I mean, who can you trust? It's Dynasty. Can you trust anyone? I knew we weren't that ugly. I knew it. <laughs>